So Jason's going to talk to you guys about finding tons of events um, and how to really find new events, increase the number of events that you're doing uh, in a way that doesn't sacrifice your lifestyle and, and uh, everything else you want to do. Thank you. And he has great vision. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. So I understand some of you guys here have been coordinating for years, even longer than I, I've been coordinating. Some of you guys are even over 500 grand a year in sales for your teams annually. And I know some of you guys have actually only been coordinating for maybe a year or less. Actually, who here has been coordinating for less than two years? Raise your hand. Okay, so that's almost like about half, half and half. That's interesting. Regardless, for those that use this information, it can be a catalyst to double or triple your current annual sales. And our team has grown since when I moved to Arizona at 300 grand of sales a year to 550, to 750, to 950. And this year our growth is 20% year to date over last year's growth, uh, heading for well over a million this year. And as Josh said, we did have nine kiosk displays in December alone. We did only 40 events in 2009, and we did over 200 events last year in 2012. I see every division over 100 events a year. I see our veteran coordinators selling 150 to 200 at just the booth annually or more. I see our national numbers at the booth over 80 million a year as a fair and show program. And the fair, by the way, the, the company itself is doing about 200 million a year. I imagine if every coordinator worked to find events, book them, and grow their teams to the 500K level, the weight that that would carry in the company. Fairs and shows would be the single biggest program and generator of CPO for Cutco. It starts with the people in this room. Have you thought about your role in this? Do you realize what being a servant does and has helped my team and my DVM? And what's done, that's done for my business and played its role in 400 grand last year in my sales. I see everyone here opening their minds like a parachute, learning for this brief moment we have right now. I see them leaving RDC, returning to wherever they reside, booking more events and growing more than ever their team and their role in their division. I see the coordinator position as one of the most important roles in every division. This is the only role in the company where a CSP or representative can affect the development of district managers and CSPs in a powerful way. Where else can a person partner with a DVM, take their top people, reps that have actually made it to FSM or in route, and work with them and help them and utilize a new element of the business for them. Adding CPO every month so they can hit bonus and profit. Having them be around and work with top high level people that are a good influence. Which by the way, I love how I get to work with only new, top newer reps. Gone are the days for me of district manager recruiting and dealing with crazy turnover. It can actually be fun working with top people to be the catalyst for them to grow, sell more, and get to FSM, to district, to 50K or more and beyond, to make an impact earlier in their career so that if later in their career they leave management, they don't leave Vector, but they look back and they say, you know, I remember that fair and show thing I did while I was in management training. That was kind of cool. I made a little money. You know what? I'm going to give that a shot. Coming back becoming a CSP. I see the Fair and Show program as the number one generator of CSPs over any other program or single idea. I believe the Fair and Show program is the greatest tool we have to helping top CSPs have a better career, schedule, lifestyle. I see everyone here implementing and memorizing the approaches and what Curtis just taught. Increasing their averages in a huge way. Teaching it to their team. 2K shows become 4K shows. Profitability. I see the Fair and Show program as the number one link to retaining reps and getting reps from 20 to 50 to newer FSMs generating CPO, putting money in their account for mailers, 
for their savings. I see the leaders of Cutco and the owners of the company recognizing this. And as we prove it over the next couple years, the recognition and the importance of the coordinator role coming to fruition and changing the face of the organizational structure of divisions across the United States. Growing your fair and show program comes down to only a couple key factors. Number one, help yourself before you help others. I'm only gonna spend a minute on this. And we'll get to number two, which will be the rest of the talk. But in the airplane, you put your oxygen mask on first before you put others on, right? Lead by example and make sure you're leading in sales, doing more service calls than your team members are, and so on. Leaders attract other leaders. That's not absolutely necessary. If you have a ton of good events, top people will come along as long as you're fair, consistent, and have integrity. However, half the CSPs in our team either came because I was coordinating or came back to Cutco because I was coordinating in the opportunity that I exemplified through my leadership in sales. I'm not bragging, I'm just making a point. Jenny Erdman had quit shows before I came down to Arizona. She came back. Von Packard had quit Cutco. He's back now because of the opportunity. Trevor Sawyer moved down to be part of the team. He's number one in his category for the Silver Cup race right now. So if you want to grow your team, start by number one, growing yourself. Number two is following the three growth keys for any show program. I call it the show team growth equation. Booths plus people plus events equals success. All three are needed, all equally important, and they're all interdependent. Just multiply or add. If you have five booths plus seven or eight people to work shows, and about one to three events per weekend, with some event weekends five or six, that's a 500K show team. If you have 10 booths, 15 people able to work shows, and an average of three to four events per weekend, with some weekends maximizing all the booths and having 10 events, boom, that's a million dollar show team right there. How many events each weekend are you doing on average? What are the most events you do in a weekend throughout the year? These are things that I, I constantly think about. This is how you form the formula, the things you want to attract. Number one, part of the equation. We'll go through each, each of these. Number one, part: a successful coordinator finds a way to get more booths. So booths. Number two, a successful coordinator runs effective meetings, updates his team, and is always teaching and sharing. Booths plus people plus, plus events. Number one, a successful coordinator finds a way to get more booths. Number two, a successful coordinator runs effective meetings, updates his team, and is always teaching and sharing, getting more people. And number three, a successful coordinator finds and books many events. This talk today is about one of the three parts of the equation, finding and booking events. You'll have to figure out the other two yourself, or maybe there'll be a way I could share more on those some other time. Um, I will say that don't just make decisions alone. Reach out to other top coordinators. Get information, top reps, and, Ol and Olean utilize them as well. Um, I will help real quick on number one and two, just so you have something to work with, and then we'll go into the events. Number one, uh, successful coordinator sells the DVM on having a lot of booth, buying booths themselves. I believe Wes has four or five booths, booths he's personally purchased, and our DMs have actually purchased booths as well. So the idea is to partner with the DVM to get more booths. And together, a successful coordinator and DVM work as a team, which I believe Josh will be talking about later, to get DMs to get booths as well. So just real quick, like I said, I'm going to be talking more about events, but I'm going to give you some tips about selling your DVM on buying booths for you. Say things like, we should be a growth-oriented team. This is after you, you, you've partnered with them, you're meeting with them, you're having lunch. 
you know, I, I want to really be a growth-oriented team, not a growth-limited team. And what I mean by that, Wes, is that we can grow into the booths. Without them, though, we, we can't book events. We can't show you what, what's possible. When you buy shoes for a kid that's growing, do you buy the shoes touching the kid's toes? Or do you buy the shoes so you don't have to buy them again a month later and allow the kid to grow into, the, into those shoes? See, it's the exact same thing for us, Wes, as a team. We need to have booths in order to grow so your people can work events, newer people can work events. We can book smaller events for them. They can get manage funds for management. They can, they can actually do more events and then have sales for a hitting bonus and retain, retain everyone so our team can grow and become bigger and have more FSM, CSPs, and district managers. We can currently only do blank shows per weekend. If you have three booths, we can only currently do three events per weekend. Rising Sun Division can do 12. I don't think they have a better division territory necessarily than us. I think we can be doing at least half of that. How can we get at least half of that, get another three booths? What can we do? I want to help you to grow your, your division. By the way, Wes, we still have to pay for tables, cloths, risers, food, banners, marketing, Windex, paper towel, um, all those things. We, we just don't have the funds and we have the capability to actually buy that much Cutco. And of course, you know, most coordinators will have their own booth and things like that, but you know, to own six booths yourself is unreasonable. And to have a, a team, you know, a larger team, it, you need help. So with those two things and together with the DVM on your side, add booths. Number two, effective meetings. Updates the team. It's always teaching and sharing. And like I said before, I believe, I truly believe all three of these things, booths, people, and events are interdependent and relying upon each other and just as equally important to creating a bigger show team, which is why I'm spending some time on these other things because although I am gonna spend most of the time on, on one of them, this is, this is super important. Meetings are super important. We have, it's critical, once every four to six weeks. We have about seven meetings a year, four to six weeks. We have seven meetings a year, not a lot. I can tell you, I believe it's a huge factor in our success. Why do managers have meetings? Why do we have conferences in RDC and SU1? Why do district managers run meetings at a local level? in their office. I won't go into how I run the meetings, but I will tell you that with meetings you retain people. And these, I guess, could be your goals with the meetings. To retain people, with meetings people feel recognized. With meetings people feel part of something. Meetings can make people take ownership of the shows that they pick. With meetings you can come together and create not dictate, but create and lead them and guide them in the, in the discussion, a better show program with brainstorming and with, with meetings you can actually have a team and create something from nothing. Even if the team is small, that's how, it, that's how it's built. Reach out to other coordinators near you to see if they have people available to work events if your team is small and they can come and work some of the events that you're booking. Another way to help develop people is to take people with you to shows who are only at 10K so maybe they can just watch and be a part of things. Then train them at 20K, let them come to the meetings, and they can work in expensive events like markets and certain fairs. And then at 30K, they can become involved in the show program in a full, a full way. And number three is successful coordinators find and book many events. With this, you're helping others by booking events for them. But it actually helps you. I'll explain what I mean. I think most people are motivated when they understand what's going on, truly. So when you have people on your team, you can book more events. But this doesn't just stop there. The depth of this is unbeknownst to many. How does this benefit you? If you have a couple of events on a particular weekend that you've done year in and year out for two to three years, and that weekend's pretty busy for your team, in fact, 
even if you had, and just apply this to what, however big your team is, if you have four or five events and that's what you do every that, uh, that particular weekend, every year, a year in and year out, you're not really looking for more events because it's a busy week and you can barely staff that. That's what I'm talking about right now. Have you ever thought of the fact that there might be another event or two going on that weekend that you aren't doing that's actually better than two or three of the events you are doing or maybe better than any of the events that you are doing? I've actually found this to be true a couple times. There could be events out there in that weekend that you're not doing that are better than the ones you're doing, but you're not looking for them because you already have a lot of events that you're used to doing that particular weekend and it's a busy weekend. There's some super solid events we have found that now I do year in and year out that I never would have found before, but because we can do 10 events in a weekend at once, we staff them, people did them, had great results, and we found them, and then now I choose those as my my position as coordinator dictates, I choose the shows that I want to work. And by the way, there's so many other shows because I book so many shows, people are happy and they have so much to work anyways, right? So everyone's happy. No one ever looks at me and says, I wish I could have, you know, I don't see why he's taking so many shows, you know. So by booking more events, you allow yourself to find the best events. Getting into booking events and strategies. So my thought was when I first started coordinating, I'm just going to work super hard at it the first year. My goal is to research like a maniac and find everything so that I didn't have to ever do it again. Right? <laughs> I'm still researching, by the way, but I just continued that mindset of that much work. And I still do the same, I still do the same thing because you, you just can't ever really stop. But... It was a great thing for me to think that I could do that and allow myself to work that hard at finding events so that later, you know, I, ha I can see how, how the whole process works when you're working that hard, like blocking off literally like five hours and just sitting down and working on finding events and calling and, and qualifying. But it is a little more casual now, I guess. It's not, not as intense, but I wanted to find the best events for every weekend of the year possible so I could not only help the team but also take care of myself and work more and have better options for myself to work. And this helped the entire team in the end. Servant leaderships. In many ways, leadership. Serving others, your personal business grows. In serving others, your personal business grows. People think about getting more people on the team and how it's going to take away for their business. But in reality, just allows you to do more events. You have the ability to find more events that could benefit you. Still, you have the ability to pick the events that you want. You're constantly learning from others. And more people on the team improves the growth of your CPO average at the shows. Approach improvements, visual improvements, research improvements. We just recently promoted a visual manager because Vaughn loves like playing with the visuals. He's always getting to the, to the booth and like, he's like, no, this goes here, this goes here, you gotta do it this way. And they're like, you don't do this with the other reps, do you? Like, you have to be a little bit nicer to them because you don't wanna hurt their feelings. Like, I don't really care. And I think a lot of things maybe don't really make a big difference. But for him, he's so into it. So if you find someone on your team that really is like that, that enjoys like making everything just perfect and neat, that's a person you can, you can engage into a role of a visualization manager. And we just recently have we had Vaughn just like a month or two ago produce um, for his role a super awesome booth setup that just removes all the tablecloths. It costs you know less than the tablecloths. Cost the custom fit ones that you know Josh. Those are cool, but it actually costs less than those. I have I have one of those, and um, those are great. But he, this is less, and it looks really 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 sharp. So. That could help your team as well. Research help. We have a research manager now, just as of like a couple months ago. And, um, and he's helped, helped me to book events. 100 events in a year is a milestone and possibly a potential. Um, I'd say it is a potential in every single division. 200 events is a realistic possibility. In fact, I believe we did 200 events last year. It's just that not all of them got like, you know, reported they were booked down or whatever and they fell through the cracks. Let's talk about qualifying real quick here. Our goal is not to book or just book a bunch of crappy shows without research and burn people out. A good rule of thumb is 
if it's a new show you've never tried before and you go through a couple qualifying steps to at least, if you're on the borderline, at least try it out once. And I learned that from Josh earlier on in the business. You know, just at least try it once, you never know. However, some events never need to be done. And here are the questions needed to make the decision if an event is worthy. Number of years it's been running. How many years has it been going on? Is it the first year or the 20th year? At the same location? At the same location? Um, and I've been burned a couple times where they change locations and half the people don't even, the attendance is like half the previous year because the people that have been going for 20 years, they, they all go down to here to the other place and then you get, you'll get that weekend, you'll get people that come in and they'll be like, yeah, I went to there, it wasn't there, I came here now. And how many people never even showed up because they couldn't find it. So that's also, uh, if you're on the border, that's a definitely, definitely a factor. Last year's attendance. Attendance, obviously, how many people are coming to the event, how many paying customers. It's one thing I learned from Josh, not just like kids and little people coming through that are like children and stuff. How many actual paying customers come to the event, which leads to the admission. How much does it cost to get into the event? Is it, co is it free? I'd rather go to an event that has 2,000 people that cost $70 to get into than to go to an event that has 10,000 people that it's free for. If you're paying 70 bucks just to get in, you know, obviously you're there for a reason. You're there to look at whatever's there and, and you're a, a shopper. The number of vendors, how many vendors are, are at the event? Is it like just 20 or 30? That's kind of a red flag, unless it's a really exclusive event where it costs a lot of money to get into for the, the customers. Or do you have two, 300 you know, vendors there? What kind of advertising are you doing? And this is just a question where you're just looking for, it's just gonna be a bunch of you know, BS basically. We're doing this, this, but that's what you're looking for. If they're like, um, well, we're, we're advertising in the newspaper, you know, then, I mean, they should be ready with an answer because that's what most people are asking when they, when they call and they're inquiring about the show, like if they're going to do it or not, what are, you, what are you doing for advertising? So it should be like, we're doing this, 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 this. Um, another thing you can ask is, uh, first of all, look and see if they have a website. That's a red flag if they don't even have a website for the event. And then um, discount. Ask if you can get a discount. And most always negotiate. You know, we work with a lot of students at blank whatever school is near you, and they work on straight commissions. So it's not like Cutco, the corporation, is actually paying for, for this event. So with that in mind, you know, the students have to pay for books and tuition and things. And, uh, you know, we're really nervous when we first try an event for the first time because it can be such a financial risk for them. So um, we'd really appreciate it if you could just maybe give us, you know, just for the first year at least, Give us a break. Maybe um, sometimes for this type of event, we'll we'll do something around fifty dollars, or if the event's like a hundred bucks, or the event's like five hundred dollars. You know, we'll do something around two hundred twenty or so for an event like of this size. And this is what you end with because you have all this information. They see that you you're like okay. So based on the information I just got, it's about two twenty for this type of event. Uh, and then you know if it, it works out and we we sell a lot and the, and the students profit, then you can be tough on us. You know the next year because we'll just we can look at the numbers and say all right, well it makes sense you know, for us to come back and pay the 500 this next time. And then we hope to be with you guys in a year in and year out relationship as we are growing our program, you know, for many, many years, we've been doing events with some people for, you know, 20, 20 years in a row. So we're very professional. A lot of the students are like business majors and things like that sometimes too. So it's good, a good internship experience for them. And just leverage the student card. You know, it's true. A lot of, so, I mean, the people on your team are students. And, um, and so it makes sense. And then obviously, you know, once it's done and booked or at the end of the conversation before you have Olean book it, you know, hey, I'd like your opinion on where the best spots are in the event. You know, just trusting you, you know, as our first year and we want to have a long-term relationship. Is there any, any uh, ideas you have on that? And then, I'm, you know, I'm trusting you as a promoter um, and th things like that. If it goes well, we're looking to spend a lot of time and money and energy towards this. That kind of verbiage helps as well. And then obviously if we were, you're booking the location somewhere in the middle, not the beginning or the end. Basically with events, to wrap that up, qualifying, and then we'll go into finding events. If you're looking for events that are over three years old, attract at least 
I'm just saying as a general rule of thumb, you might not even really need to go beyond this. If, if you're look, you have someone that's something that's like, you know, a few years old at least, and it attracts at least three to 5,000 people and costs like $50 to $200, it's usually a winner if, if, you know, just to at least try out, at least try the show once. It's a great way to separate uh, crap shows away from that. So how do we find events? So here's some of the keys to finding events. Here's some of the, um, here's some of the things that I do, like, that first, the first thing is men, having a mentality that there's still so much opportunity out there is, is critical. Because it's like with our sales, we have a goal to sell X amount for the push. If we don't have our goal, we're just kind of going towards nothing. But if you have, if you have a goal of, oh, there's nothing here, and my there's nothing here, and you just continue to think this, then you're creating the block, a blockade to finding events. So you're, you have to release and say, okay, well, you know, there's still so much opportunity to grow here. And believe it when you say it and think it. And that, that will allow you to be open to finding things a lot, lot easier. It may sound weird, just trust me. Utilizing every single City Chamber of Commerce website to look up events. Getting your top promoters emails and having them send a, a list of every single show they coordinate. Specifically looking up types of shows for the calendar um, like particular shows like music festivals, national car shows, you have a list of all those in, in that book right there. You know, specifically Googling each of those and looking for those particular, that particular word type of show. Going to other companies' websites and seeing what they're doing. You know, if, if, uh, if there's a company that's at every show that you're, that you're at, what else are they doing? Go to their website, find out if they have a list of events. We have a list of events on our site, Cutco. Some of them do as well. Get a list of zip codes and cities in your territory from your DVM. They have this because they send mailers out to all, all zip codes. They, have, they can get it if they don't have it. Look at the list, sort it, and find any city that has at least two or three zip codes in it. That means it's big enough to have events. So there might even be cities you've never even heard of in your territory. Research those cities if they have at least a couple zip codes. So get a list of zip codes and cities from your DVM that are in your territory. Looking at specific venues, call and contact the venue, you know, the, the um, convention center, and get a list of all the events they do. I learned this from Evelyn, actually, the State Board of Tourism. And that, by the way, if you want to have fun qualifying a lot of events, go there because it has a lot of events, a lot of little events. I mean, it doesn't have everything. It does miss a couple things, but it does have, that's like the single biggest list that you, that you could literally just sit there and there's so many events, it's ridiculous. And you have to qualify all of them. And then a list of, comp of events from a company. Purchase one. So there's companies that actually have lists of shows and how many people, vendors are there, how much they cost, you know, all these stats about each event. So it almost pre-qualifies a lot of events for you. And there's 10,000 people, it's $100 and, you know, whatever. And then you can, you can uh, pay for that or have, ask your DVM to help pay for it. Hey, say, we're looking for, I'm looking for events for the newer reps, for, for the younger CSPs in the division, I'm looking to buy a list of events and information. I mean, it's only like 20, 30 bucks anyways. It's not that expensive. And that's, that's huge. If you haven't done that, just do it and try it. And then again, the key is to schedule blocks of time to research and book shows. Schedule blocks of time. You know, from like 6 to 10 at night, well, you know, a couple nights of, of the... Of the of the month, and then let's say you're on you're out uh, traveling, at a, and you're doing shows, so your significant other's not there anyways. Instead of going out and having a couple of beers or whatever at some bar, you know you could go do that. But look at research events while you're doing that. Don't just watch like a sports game or, or just watch TV in your room. Start researching events while you're out of town, so when you come back into town, you don't have to work and you can relax and uh, and have a better lifestyle as well. 
So to wrap up, in summary, finding and booking events is one of your three pillars to an effective fair and show team. Realize you're changing lives. Realize that you, as a coordinator, have the ability to generate hundreds of thousands of CPO by coordinating, to take a huge chunk of that for yourself, be a stepping stone for newer reps and FSMs to improve our great business in our great business to get to the next level, and understand that you alone hold the key and that through your DVM, might not, they might not realize the full significance of this and the potential that you're ready to work hard and to show them. Cheers to 500K and beyond for each of you, and for those over 500K, cheers to a million.